Welcome back to C Sharp Application Development, and uh, this is going to be the uh, the sort of one and only uh, potentially way too long video um, about T4 text templates, uh, which allow you to do code generation, um, which is sort of a <clears throat> an interesting thing um, that you might find uh, comes up on a job interview, um, or at least gives you kind of a leg up um, on those interviews. So. Um, so far in the class, uh, what we've done is we've seen that um, if for a web API and an SPA, or a web API and a WPF app, or a web API and a console app, that there are really three kinds of pieces to it outside of the kind of persistence component that we'll put aside for a moment. So the first thing is a web call that originates on the client side. Um, so if you're talking about a console application, that could be um, a call using the HTTP client uh, uh, API, um, or it could be uh, using the dollar sign HTTP uh, service inside of Angular uh, or some sort of equivalent of that. The second thing um, is you need a web API controller um, that sits on the server side that actually accepts traffic from the client um, and it deserializes all of the properties and it actually implements the, uh, the kind of client facing uh, communication interface that you need to actually send information down to the third component, um, which is an EC controller. So the EC um, does all of the uh, kind of business logic around taking information from the client and then sending it to persistence or taking information from the client, uh, running some calculations, and then sending a message back to the client. So um, if you look at um, item number two and item number three um, specifically, um, there is a lot of really repetitive stuff going on here. <clears throat> so um, if you have um, students and classes and courses and semesters, or if you have movies and music and reviews and whatever, um, you're constantly going to be um, A, generating methods for API controllers and B, generating EC controllers that feed from those web API controllers and C, even generating DCOs or actual models um, that are going to be used by the EC and by the web API. So, if you go back to your assignment number four and you look at your code, um, for each of the entities that you had in your project, um, you probably had essentially a code clone for adding a new record, for getting a record by an ID, for searching for a record, uh, for updating and adding a record, so on and so forth and so forth. So basically what has happened um, is from a, a data management perspective, we have uh, provided this kind of really uh, regimented template um, that we can follow time and time and time again. So if you're trying to build um, a data management application that manages movie reviews, or if you're trying to uh, build a data management application that deals with courses or um, university information or for um, legal cases or for whatever, um, basically what you can do is you can build a bunch of entities. From those entities you can build ECs. From those ECs you can build web API controllers. And then you can build a client-side application that calls down to that server-side code. Um, and the, the two are kind of decoupled from each other. And um, each of these entities really has control over its own API controllers, its own EC controller, and its own DTO or model. Um, so what we're noticing here is that what we basically have done is we've taken a whole bunch of industries or we've taken a whole bunch of ideas that are potentially very, very, very different. And we have essentially fit them into one uh, kind of software template that we can use over and over and over again um, to support any number of UIs that we want. So it could be a, a phone app or an SPA or a console app or a WPF app. Um, it could be a Java application because there's nothing saying that the client has to be written in C Sharp. Um, it could be whatever you want, um, but the server side code we've seen has been basically a code clone between entities as we're doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. So 
um, enter T4 templates. Um, so these things are also called T4 text templates. Um, and basically what they do is they provide a combination of control logic to let you actually execute C sharp inside of a template um, and sort of standard text that lets you print things to a file. And what it does is it lets you generate a dynamic text file that then can be uh, sort of reconstituted into whatever type of file you want it to be. Um, and at the end of the day, you can think about basically any of the source code files that we imagine uh, being useful in any of these projects um, as just the text files. So you can think of HTML, um, any of the C-sharp that you've written for a console application, all of your JavaScript controllers, web API controllers, enterprise controllers or ECs, um, request classes that you use to actually submit post requests. Um, it could be Java applications, it could be whatever you want. And basically, at the end of the day, you can still open those things in Notepad. So all of those things are just text with a different uh, file extension. And so um, what this, these T4 templates do is they give us a really kind of natural way uh, to generate all of these different files given the fact that on the server side and in a lot of cases in the client side uh, we can find these massive uh, areas of overlap um, where you don't necessarily want to have to maintain 65 versions of the same code um, that is essentially different only because of the entity that the code is actually working on. So um, if we look at the benefits of using T4 templates versus uh, just kind of hard coding or manually coding all of your own controllers for the EC layer, for the web API layer, um, for the models or the DTOs, um, what you're going to do is reduce errors that are caused by um, a software engineer basically just losing focus. Um, all of this stuff is basically copy paste code. Um, and what's going to ultimately happen is you're going to copy and paste something, you're going to miss a type. Um, you're going to miss a dot, you're going to miss something very minor, and that's going to cause a bug in the code that's probably not minor. Um, also, what's going to happen um, is this provides a single point of failure uh, for your generated code. Um, so potentially, you have a bug in one of your ECs. Um, you're going to copy and paste that over and over and over again, and so you're going to replicate that bug uh, through however many uh, ECs you create until you find the bug. Um, if you have generated the EC, the bug will be in the generated code and it'll be able to go back and actually uh, modify it and fix it and then regenerate all the ECs and then everything is fine. Uh, put in parentheses here, this could obviously also go badly, right? So if you um, are modifying uh, the template and you introduce a bug, now, instead of breaking only one class or one EC, now obviously you've broken all the ECs. Um, but if you remember um, sort of the, the fail, fail fast uh, architecture idea um, is these kinds of issues that are raised uh, by uh, introducing a bug to a template are usually catastrophic. Um, and so when you compile the project or when you try to publish the project, it's going to massively fail and you're going to be immediately aware um, that something really bad happened and that you should go and fix it. Um, this is very different than if you have just one EC that has the problem and then you're waiting on either testing or a, a client to find the issue and then raise the issue to you. Um, and it turns out uh, that you can actually use T4 templates to generate your entire application stack. And actually my uh, company has started trying to do this. Um, so you can generate all of the code for your um, dialogues that are based on the entities, that are based on the models on the server side. So you can generate all of the HTML, you can generate all of the controllers on the client side based on what the entity uh, properties are. So if you know that you have a, a string property and you want to expose that to the user, um, you could put a text box on an HTML page and bind that text box to the appropriate property in the controller and then send that over to a generated API. Uh, controller that then sends it to a generated EC that generates um, the call down all the way to persistence. Um, so essentially what you have um, is 80% potentially, maybe a little more of your code generated um, at a button push. 
Um, and then you are really responsible for maybe the 20% or the 10% um, that is not uh, cookie cutter. Um, it's all the sort of custom stuff. It's all of the really kind of one-off development tasks. Um, and so uh, what you can also do um, is if there are layers, so if there are hierarchies of entities that have maybe special behavior, uh, or if you've implemented a whole bunch of inheritance, um, and that inheritance allows you to do specific things um, with specific dialogues on derived classes, for example, um, you can always provide override characteristics. And when we look at the, the sort of code along that, that goes with this video, um, you'll see how you can uh, basically iterate through a list of things um, and you can very easily modify um, what the, uh, the template generation will do based on the type um, of entity, for example, that you're trying to iterate over. So um, there are really two types of T4 templates um, in the wild. Um, the first one is runtime templates. And these are, as you would expect by the name, uh, generated at runtime. Um, and so what happens here um, is you can, um, at runtime, uh, call a method um, on an engine class, which we'll go over in the code along, um, that uh, generates a file. And you can read that file. And as long as that file is in an interpreted language, um, you can hot load that file. Um, so in days of old, before um, uh, sort of JavaScript took over, um, you could do things like generate the HTML page with the correct uh, current system time or date or whatever, and actually display that to the end user um, with no dynamic uh, controller on the page at all. Um, essentially what's happening is you are creating um, the HTML to be loaded as the DOM um, at runtime through T4 uh, text transformation. Um, the other way that you can do this is through design time templates. And so this is now kind of the, the de facto uh, type of template that we're talking about. Um, what this means is that at compilation time or when you actually build uh, prior to deploying the system, um, what you're going to do is uh, generate some T4 templates that build code that is then uh, compiled. And that compiled code essentially reconstitutes your application. So um, these things are very, very popular um, because you can uh, generate huge stacks of repetitive code at compile time. So when you actually build your latest build, um, all of this generated code magically appears and you don't necessarily have to have um, someone manually create and check in that code. Essentially, all you, uh, you have to do is check in the templates and then when somebody builds uh, the solution that has the templates in it, all of the code um, gets generated um, at build time. So um, there are a bunch of different kind of components of what a T4 template actually is. Um, the first of these is called a uh, directive. Um, and so these actually uh, determine how your template is going to be transformed. Um, so these can include things like changing the file extension type. Um, it also includes things like importing specific uh, libraries or referencing specific assemblies. Um, and we'll go through um, specific examples of these in the code along. Um, this is also a link um, where you can go to kind of look at all the different uses for directives. Um, the other type is just text. Um, so text is directly copied um, to a text file that lives behind or underneath the uh, text transformation file or the text template file. Um, and so um, basically uh, what happens is you can use these text um, uh, kind of components to either generate hard-coded values, um, but you can also um, impose uh, conditional logic inside of those text uh, components to put dynamic content in them. Um, so it's very, very similar to um, how you generate HTML with JavaScript. Um, if you remember, the two nested curly braces will allow you to put um, actual uh, sort of derived values into the UI. Um, this does a very, very similar thing. And we'll look at um, some examples of how to actually do it. 
Um, the third um, are control blocks, and essentially what these do is they allow you to run C sharp commands inside of the template itself. Um, so if you have a template that needs to iterate over a list and then provide um, sort of dynamic uh, list of properties or a dynamic list of structs or whatever inside of your class, um, or a dynamic list of classes inside of a namespace, um, you could have a for each loop or a for loop or a while loop or whatever inside of one of these control uh, directives. Um, and then use that in tandem with a text directive um, and then actually generate code that's of a, uh, an arbitrary length. Uh, and we'll actually look at that um, in the code along um, and the assignment for the end of the, of the semester will actually be filling in the blanks um, of what I've left out of the code along. Um, so you'll get uh, a lot of, uh, sort of practice with that. So um, we can uh, kind of talk about uh, sort of the standard uh, com components first. Um, so a standard control block is enclosed with these uh, kind of weird tags. It's a uh, triangle brace with a pound sign. Um, and these things can enclose any sort of valid C sharp code. Um, so for example, if we wanted to write to the text file behind our template file, um, the numbers one through five, um, we could easily just put a for loop inside of these uh, control blocks tags um, and uh, use the write function um, to write uh, this list of integers out. Um, expression control blocks um, actually uh, perform the same function as those nested uh, curly braces inside of JavaScript and HTML5. Um, for Angular, so um, these are actually going to evaluate whatever expression is inside of the tags, cast it to a string, and then display that value. Um, so for example, if you want to put the value 10 inside of your text file and your template, you could use this simple expression. Um, what's gonna happen is the C Sharp uh, engine is actually going to um, uh, run this expression, um, simplify it to 10, cast it to a string, and then display that value wherever you have this tag in your, uh, in your template. Um, you also have uh, feature control blocks, um, and what these things do um, is they allow you to implement full, um, full methods. Um, you can implement properties, whatever you want, inside of these special tags. Um, I use these less um, than the other tags, um, and basically all you need to do um, is uh, insert some valid C sharp uh, implementation code uh, between these tags, and then you can actually use this implementation in um, some of these uh, standard control blocks that you have in the other parts of the template. Um, the other thing that you have um, is the uh, include directive. Um, so the include directive works um, exactly like if you've ever used LaTeX, uh, the include command essentially just takes the file that you're including and copy pastes it wherever you have the include line. Um, and so here, um, what we're doing um, is we're basically just putting uh, the file contents that are located at c uh, slash some other template dot text into whatever template has this include directive in it. Um, and so if uh, you set this file template uh, extension to something else, it will actually uh, transform that file uh, once it's inserted. Um, so if you, this file extension actually exists in the template that consumes this include file. And so basically what will happen, it will take the text out of this file, put it into a text transformation file, and then change the overall file to this file extension. Um, and so if you don't necessarily follow this, that's entirely fine. We're gonna look at it in the code along and I think it'll make a lot more sense. Um, and so one word of warning is that um, typically you do not want to take uh, text templates and then include them in other text templates without managing the order in which they're transformed. Um, so text tran transformation order is something we're gonna talk about in the code along, um, but uh, typically uh, you don't want to leave that up to the uh, text transformation engine, uh, its sort of uh, desires, um, because what can happen um, is if you expect this to be raw text, 
instead of a transformed file and it gets transformed prior to being included, um, what will happen is your um, overall template will fail because this will not actually be what you expect to copy paste into the template. Um, so there is quite a bit um, of uh, kind of best practices around how to use includes um, in the assignment and in the, um, the, the sort of most of the code that I write with uh, text transformation templates. I don't use this um, primarily because I want to have very, very tight control um, around uh, how and when and where these uh, uh, text files get transformed. Um, but you can certainly um, use it uh, to your heart's content. Um, and as long as you're careful, um, you can kind of avoid any sort of weird problems. So um, we've talked a little bit about how um, kind of tedious tasks for software engineers don't typically go well for you if you're a software company, um, and they don't necessarily go well for you if you're a software engineer. Um, you don't want to do tedious work, um, and when you try to do tedious work, it just kind of falls apart. Um, and so uh, what you want to do is you want to provide um, users the ability to do as sort of non-trivial work as possible. Um, but at the same time, you want to sometimes expose development work to clients um, if you want clients to be able to customize your uh, software package. And so, for example, if you had a software package sort of like um, SAP um, or Salesforce.com, um, you want to be able to provide people uh, the ability to insert their own code um, or you want them to extend the code that's there um, and you don't necessarily want them to have to be sort of full-fledged developers in order to do that. Um, so what you can do um, is you can use C4 templating to expose toolkits um, that essentially provide UI um, for users, be they internal developers or external clients, um, to visually create things like services um, by dragging and dropping components onto um, a, a sort of workspace um, or by essentially just providing some sort of markup or configuration. And so the markup and configuration uh, idea um, is where we're gonna go in the uh, code along um, that you can easily kind of translate that to a more WYSIWYG uh, kind of scenario. Um, so if you think um, about maybe your, uh, your experience with uh, assignment number four or assignment number five, um, essentially every service um, and every EC, uh, every API controller has some sort of core type. Um, essentially what happens is each service has some sort of finite list of methods and each of those methods typically expose some kind of pre-canned operation that works on one of those core types. Um, so what you can do um, is you can look at um, the order of operations, the inbound parameters, and the return type, and you can actually generate the C sharp that implements both the API service uh, controller and the EC um, purely based on either markup or a WYSIWYG uh, de uh, designer. So what this does is it allows you to expose um, really kind of complicated stuff to uh, junior developers and those junior developers can generate code um, that is restricted to very common pat uh, patterns and uh, practices that the uh, company is comfortable with that they know do not uh, expose bugs to the system. And so uh, what you can have is you can have junior developers or you can even have BAs. You could have uh, people at client sites, for example, generating their own service code um, completely outside um, of your version control, control system, completely outside of your actual managed code. Um, it is code that they own and that they uh, manage, um, but it is generated with a sort of WYSIWYG developer that you have built um, based on T4 templating. Um, and so basically what we're doing is we're exposing this whole world of service generation um, that is purely based on something as simple as a JSON blob, for example. So um, in the code along that I'm about to do now, um, what you will see is you can actually express um, some entities using a very rudimentary uh, JSON and provide a name for what the entity is um, a list of properties and the types for those properties. And then you can actually start generating um, ECs and models 
um, and all sorts of stuff based purely on that markup. Um, to the WYSIWYG side of things, um, you could actually build a UI that allows a person to visually create that markup um, and then that links the user experience to um, the markup that then links the markup to uh, actually creating the services and creating the web API and potentially even creating the client side code and all of that. Um, so hopefully this video provided a sort of overview of what we're actually going to look at. Um, and in the next video, we're actually going to walk through the code um, and kind of look at it. Um, the final um, assignment in the class is to complete the code from the, um, the code along. Um, and hopefully that is like maybe a two hour uh, experience door to door. Um, and I will post um, the code as a zip file. And basically all you have to do is take it. Um, even if you have a Mac, um, you can copy and paste the folder structure into your um, Visual Studio solution. Um, and then uh, all you have to do is modify my code um, as part of assignment number six. Um, so stay tuned for the code along um, and the code along will kind of explain what you need to do, um, but it'll also put all of this stuff in, in context of kind of concrete uh, development with T4 templates. Um, so thank you for tuning in um, and I'll see you in the code along.